Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this event of the Scottish EUBC DCA. Um, check out my crib where you can see the background of our rooms while we're chatting about topics you requested for us. So today I'm going to talk about the far right populists in Europe. Um, where do they come from? What can we do about it? Or do we want to do something about it in the first place? Um, well, how the way I envision this lecture to look like is as follows. I am firstly going to talk briefly about the definition of populism, because I think that's a definition of far-right populism, because I think that's very useful, especially because it's quite muddled water and people tend to use the word populism to just mean outright bad. Um, I think that's unhelpful. Then we're going to talk about the history of populism uh, in Europe. I'm going to specifically focus on the Netherlands, because it's the country I come from, and use the example of several populist parties we've had in the past and currently have, uh, where they come from, what issues are at stake for them. And from that history, I'm going to build a general framework of what populists think, uh, which I think is an incredibly useful tool to have because it makes you understand better what these parties aim for, why they are so successful, um, and therefore also understand how difficult it is to actually tackle them. Um, I am finally going to talk a little bit about how they're characterized in debating and how you can use those characterizations or abuse those characterizations in order to be better at debating these populist movements. Um, as always with these workshops, if you have any questions, there's a chat uh, which you can fill in can make sure that uh, I see a question pop up and just do that and I'll try to answer those questions as I go along. I'll, I'll read them aloud so everyone can hear them and I hope you're going to have a great session. Uh, great if you're all here, um, especially considering the heat wave that's currently in North and Western Europe. I can imagine you have better things to do. Um, if you aren't here but you're listening later that's also great and completely understandable and i hope you will learn a lot and also if you are later and you can only and you still have some questions after this workshop video you can of course always ask those questions to youtube or to the facebook channel feed and we'll make sure that we can try and answer that for you so you can also learn from this video in that way so having said that let's go start with the definition of populism and i think the important bit to think about the definition of populism to think about what goes wrong with that definition is that very often people think populism just means catering to the will of the people and the difficulty with that definition is that it seems to include almost all democratic parties because almost all democratic party try to cater to the will of the people somewhat now populism defines itself in a few different ways. So the first aspect of populism is that they have a quite clear notion of what the people is. So they think there is a homogeneous group of people within a nation that they call the people. You can also call, often call them the native people because they're one of the characteristics is that they are the ones who have lived within those borders uh, within a nation construct the longest or at the very least for a very long time. They also harken back to rituals that define who those people are. In my country, for instance, those rituals combine the celebration of King's Day, but also the celebration of Center Class. And attacks on those code traditions, for instance, if they come from colonial times and are seen as insensitive towards minorities or newer members of our societies, are therefore seen as an attack on the people by the populists. The second thing that is essential in the framework of populist movements is that they believe that there is an elite and that the elite's interests are directly opposite to the people's interest. So that there's currently an established group of people who hold most leverages of power within the country, be it for instance the political power, so the established political parties for instance that have hold and, and won elections for 80 to 100 years in most European democracies, but also, for instance, the media elite, and often those are now framed by the right wing as being left wing media elites. So they are cultural, culturally progressive elites, uh, and they believe that those elites are against the desires of the people. I think that's the second part that's interesting. The third thing that's important about populist, people, about right wing populist, is what their aims exactly are. Because you have both right wing and left wing populists, uh, and whilst this video won't concern left wing populists just too much. The left wing populists, of course, are an interesting tide as well. You can think of the pink tide uh, uh, populism in uh, Latin America, which proved to address the will of the people by having mass redistribution programs. You can look at Syriza in Greece, or you can look at Podemos in Spain, 
uh, or even to an extent you could think about Jeremy Corbyn uh, in, in UK or even Jesse Klaver in the Netherlands, all as being rather populist on the left, wanting to do, have broad scale programs and also believing that the elite currently isn't catering towards an underclass. Um, those are interesting groups and they, they, they follow a lot of the same logic. The reason why we're focusing on the far right is the thing because that's the most prominent electorally gainful mechanism of anti-elite opposition that's currently dominant in Europe. So I think it's very useful to, to talk about them. But uh, we can talk about left-wing populism if you, so if you give that question later on in this news feed. And I'm more than happy to give examples on them. And uh, as a good exercise, try and think of where some of the analysis that we're going to talk about later in this workshop, where they can also fit into the framework of left-wing populism. But right-wing populism, if you look at the definition of them, they believe a couple of things. Um, the first thing is that they, so, so the, one thing that's difficult characterizing them and difficult in, in, in understanding there, because most populists follow on a centrist axis. Um, that is, for instance, because if we for instance, look at the PVV in the Netherlands, they are very right wing conservative and cultural issues. Uh, and even they believe quite strictly in a free market. So, for instance, they are they, they think that they want to preserve the nativist culture of the Netherlands, they oppose uh, migration, but on economic issue, they, they cater to a left-wing bias. So they want, for instance, to have enormous expenditures on healthcare and elderly care, uh, which often justify with the idea that they want to make this, uh, that they want to, to help the people who they say have built up this country. Um, so that often makes them hard to classify exactly in that way, but their most prominent feature is the right-wing elements, which is why we often talk about them in right-wing fashions. Uh, beyond that, they tend to very often, for various reasons, espouse right-wing free market economic trade. So for instance, the PVV in the Netherlands, whilst they espouse these left-wing ideas, in Parliament they actually tend to vote to the right. And most political scientists don't have an exact like theoretical explanation for why that's the case. Uh, the suggestion in the Netherlands is that this is because Geert Wilders himself come, came from the VVD, the centre-right party in the Netherlands, so he holds those ideas, but also that quite often they're funded by, for instance, uh, um, conservative American groups. Um, so they cater to, for instance, free trade ideas, which are all prevalent in their donor groups. So those are th theories, but we don't exactly know why they opt for those kind of free market suggestions, even though that's not necessarily part of their core ideology. Having said that, let's talk about the history of populism. And we're going to talk, talk about, like, start with history of populism in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is a country that's very much defined by the Second World War experience. And uh, the Netherlands was in ruin after the Second World War. It needed to be rebuilt after the uh, Second World War devastated a large part of the infrastructure of the economy of the people. And there weren't enough people at the time to, to help with the rebuilding project. We lacked manpower, which is why manpower was shipped in uh, originally from Southern Europe. And I think that's an important element to address because nowadays we see the populism very often talks about Muslims uh, as being the over-dominant, predominant concern. But migration, first of all, in Europe came not necessarily from uh, Muslim-majority countries, but very often in Northwestern Europe, at least, it came from Southern European countries, Italians, Spaniards. Uh, they were part of the first wave of uh, post-reconstruction migrants in Northwestern Europe who started helping rebuild uh, our countries, uh, performing cheap manual labor. Uh, the intent of the time was that, that this would be a... Uh, um, uh, non-permanent form of settlement so that they would return back to Italy and Spain once most of the jobs were done. Now, we do know that there were tensions back then already uh, between, uh, for instance, Italian groups of migrant workers in the eastern co former cotton city of Enschede uh, and Dutch nativists that they were fighting, for instance, be uh, in bars because they were afraid that the Italians were trying to steal their girls. Um, so there were always some under under tension skin. I think the important thing to recognize here is that there's often a large amount of cultural miscommunication and some people feel that people from the outside can, could potentially be a danger to, to their way of life. So, so that they, for instance, now face more competition for girls that they assume were up for grabs for themselves. And then we're talking most about men and whilst the characterization that white men are uh, the only ones who vote for populist is uh, a little bit close to the skew. Those are, however, the historical documents that we know more about. Although we do know, for instance, there are more the racialized characteristics in the Netherlands as well. There's been a large amount of, in, there's been a large amount of observations, for instance, that upper white women certainly held racialized viewpoints about former colonial uh, uh, servants. Um, so we do see that those kind of elements are were widespread across the country and therefore the idea that it's just the angry white male is, is simplistic for a start. But 
the second wave of those migrants came from the Muslim majority countries. In the Netherlands, it was specifically people from Turkey and later people from Morocco, uh, who in a large part uh, came to the Netherlands in the 1960s and 70s to help with the reconstruction. And again, those were envisioned to be on uh, temporary stays and they were envisioned to leave after uh, a while. Some of them, however, choose to remain. They choose to take, bring their family to from Turkey to the Netherlands and uh, live a life here. And this caused some problems with regards to their integration, because given that the governments at the time hadn't imagined that these people would stay for very long, they hadn't really invested in helping them, for instance, learn the language, um, learn how the government system worked, uh, and how to integrate them in society fully. There weren't, for instance, housing places available for them. Very often they worked uh, in, in, in local camps. And as a consequence, these uh, people were not able to fully participate in the rest of Dutch society. This was, however, also a time that was marked very much by uh, two, I think, important ideas. The first idea was the legacy of the Second World War, the legacy of Nazism, and thereby the idea that, that arose in, in the joined with it in the 1960s of equality for all, that racism and stereotypism was a bad thing, and as a consequence, you shouldn't ne negatively portray someone. It's led to a taboo in Dutch society to criticize effectively migration policies being ineffective, because that felt as veering too close to criticizing Turkish people, Moroccan people, or Italian people uh, for their essential characteristics, and as a consequence, was seen as being too bad. At the same time, we do have reports from the Ministry of Social Affairs at the time that they didn't fully comprehend or understand the cultural differences and nuances of those people, so they couldn't fully really understand what they were, uh, and that they already felt that there was a storm form of hierarchy. In other words, that the Western or Dutch culture was a... Uh, appreciable culture, the one that should be more dominant in our society, that our values, that our use of the language, that the things that we hold dear to us, the Dutch myths that we build ourselves in the Netherlands, that is ideas that we should act like normal, um, that we should be friendly, but be re relatively reserved in public spaces, that those are important elements of a cultural life, and those are seen as more important uh, than other elements, and therefore the idea was that we need to educate them, rather than that we can learn something from them. Uh, it was a one-way street in that regard. The second wave of migrants that is important in the, in the, in the foundational history of populist movements is uh, with regards to the former colonial subjects. I think this, this level of analysis doesn't only work for the Netherlands, it also certainly works for France. Uh, I'd imagine it could definitely work for the UK. Um, in the Netherlands, we had a couple of colonies, the most prominent ones being Suriname in, the, uh, in Latin America, that's a country to the north of Brazil, and Indonesia, which was called the Dutch Indies at the time. Now, we had two waves of migration from those regions. The first wave came in uh, in the 1950s. After the War of Independence in Indonesia, we fought alongside with a group of people who were promised self-determination in, in exchange for fighting all the Dutch armies. Those were people from the Moluks. Uh, and, th and those people, therefore, when Netherlands, the Netherlands lost the war for independence, couldn't stay in Indonesia. So many of them who fought for the Netherlands, Dutch army were shipped to the Netherlands. Um, although they were initially, for instance, housed in very poor conditions, some of them even were housed in a former Nazi concentration camp in Westerbork in the east of the country. Uh, and it took a long time for them to settle. We didn't provide them with very much assistance. This led to quite a large amount of aggrievement amongst the Mughal population, uh, coupled with the fact that they felt betrayed because they felt that uh, they were promised a homeland that they didn't receive, which meant a very, the, the children of these Moloks started to rebel. And in the 1970s, this, for instance, led to a, a uh, capture of the trains uh, where they tried to take a train hostage, which eventually had to be solved by uh, army intervention. Um, this is, in, I think, still a predominantly controversial topic to talk about in the Netherlands, and there's still research going on to exactly what happened and who owes whom an apology in that regard with the Moloch's community feeling that the army took it too far um, in try and they killed some of the uh, captures in that regard. The second wave of migrants from the Netherlands came from Suriname, and those were people who generally came from Suriname from early onwards. The interesting thing in Suriname as well is that the uh, Surinamese people were tried to be pushed away from the Dutch people, so there was very little interaction in Suriname between Dutch and Surinamese subjects in and of itself. Uh, but many of them moved to Suriname 
uh, moved from Suriname to the Netherlands. Uh, many of them left after the independence because they felt that the Surinamese newly established government was weak and that they wouldn't provide much economic prosperity and they wanted to gain this opportunity to grant Dutch citizenship. You can blame them because uh, they, they, Suriname was granted independence in 1975 and only a few years after a military dictatorship under the rule of Desi Bouterse erupted there, uh, who killed many dissidents in the December killing, so you can't really fault them for that. But they also had trouble integrating in parts of the Netherlands, although they are now seen as one of the more strongly integrated ones together with the Hindu Indonesians. Um, they did for instance, profess difficulty with some Dutch traditions, predominantly the one about Black Pete, which is a blackface caricature um, of a black man which walks around with our version of Santa Claus. Um, and there's a very prominent debate in current Dutch society about whether or not this is a racist or non-racist tradition. So those are the migration streams. Now, why is migration streams, why are they important? As said before, uh, the migration streams led to some difficulty because the Dutch government didn't have correct policies in actually helping them integrate. So number one, they, they didn't have policies for language acquisition in the first place. And number two, they had a rather simplistic notion that uh, that integration should be a one-way street where we don't take into account the cultural preferences of minorities. And as a consequence, there was a lack of integration from, uh, from minorities certainly from people who arrived, but also the their sons and daughters who are often called second generation migrants uh, and even third generation migrants had difficulty adapting to Dutch life and Dutch culture. At the same time, uh, criticizing this idea and professing for policy solutions was something that was seen as a very negative thing uh, because it felt that it was a racist thing to do. In that backdrop, well, we've well, we have had populist parties before and you used to have agro-populist agro parties and those are uh, groups that predominantly focus on the interests of farmers uh, because they believe that farmers were hit, taken away their incentives by the elites, the urban elites who didn't care about farming and life. Um, the big, I think, rele first relevant populist movement came with the election of the Centrum Partij in the, uh, 1982 and their leader Hans Janmaat into the um, parliament. Hans Janmaat was a quite controversial figure. Um, he Said things that nowadays I think Geert Wilders would say if he's on a generous day, but back in the time were truly scandalous thing to say. He coined the phrase that the Netherlands is full and full is full, uh, and he was an incredibly controversial and, po and, and polarizing figure. How did the Dutch establishment treat this man? With contempt. The way that Hans Janmaat and the Centrum Partij were treated was with a policy of cordon sanitaire, in other words, closed ranks policy. That meant that this person was not engaged with on the parliamentary floor. People would literally leave the parliament as soon as he would start speaking. Uh, the media was very negatively portraying him and his viewpoints. Uh, and it's even led to a climate where an attack on his life was made by uh, ultra left activists. Um, during a party congress where his uh, he, he, he escaped unscathed, I think his wife lost her leg, um, and he was, see, he was incredibly demonized. Now the populist movement at, of the Centrum Partij faded out in the late 1990s, and the ideas for that were a couple. The first one was infighting with Jan Maat and his uh, other members of the party uh, who couldn't manage to sustain their uh, viewpoints. Uh, there, were, there were difference of viewpoints, but also they hadn't gained much traction in elections. They were kind of stalling, and as a consequence, it was seen that the movement was lacking. There was genuine discontent in the ranks of the Centrum Partij. The second idea was that the VVD, the Centre Right Party, uh, which, which is roughly comparable to the Tories uh, in the U in the UK or the uh, CDU in Germany or the UMP in France, they started under the leadership of Hans Riegel, they started to take over some of the ideas centered in Partij, and at the very least criticizing elements of migration as they saw was being problematic. And Fritz Bolkenstein, who later be became the intellectual father of Geert Wilders, uh, took that direction further in the 1990s amongst the VVD. So in the 1990s, we didn't have that much of a populist movement, but then late in the 90s uh, and early 2000s, a man called Pim Pertuin arose on the Dutch scene. And Pim Pertuin had a couple of very interesting characteristics. For one, he was flamboyantly outward gay. And I think that's important to recognize because there are quite a large amount of certainly white gay people who vote for populist parties. And their reason had not so much to do as not so much with general fear of migration, so the idea that migration can lead to job loss. They fear specifically the cultural aspect 
of some migrant cultures, they feel that they fear that, they, that this, these are anti-gay cultures and they feel threatened in the ability to be gay. And this was the same for Pim Fortuyn. He believed as a consequence that Islam was anti-gay and that, that he was going to be threatened by it. The second, I think, interesting element of Pim Fortuyn was that he was a, a member of the liberal intelligentsia. He was a lecturer at the university, at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So he wasn't necessarily a people, a person who could say that he belonged to the people in that regard, um, if you'd look at his background, he'd very much be a part of the elite. And I think you see that across multiple elements. So Nigel Farage, for instance, it was, I think, Oxford educated or LSE educated. Uh, Donald Trump, for, for instance, is a multi-millionaire billionaire who was um, grew up in a family of wealth. Um, and I think, therefore, the, their personal characterizations, uh, where they come from, doesn't seem to be as important as the way they speak, for instance. So what they have all in common is, for instance, a very large capacity to want to speak plain language and a language that for instance therefore is understandable to the uh, people who often just communicate at a far simpler level as the elite um, they use less complicated words and i think that's an important element to take into account as well in order understanding where there's a magnetic pool between the elite uh, figurehead of a populist movement and the people themselves pim Fortuyn grew up in a world or, or intellectually grew up in a world where Samuel Hunt Huntington's Clash of Civilization became a good idea and the main precursor to the end of history thesis of Francis Fukuyama. So if you look at the ideology debate of the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet, of the Soviet Union, uh, Francis Fukuyama proclaimed the end of history, by which he meant that the history of ideas of what society is best has been fought and won by democratic liberalism. In response, or partial response, Samuel Huntington wrote his, his thesis, The Clash of Civilizations, in which he predicted that there are civilizations which are immutable in their characteristics, can see eye to eye in their characteristics, and therefore would sooner rather than later clash in, in their viewpoints. And some of these, uh, and one of these cultures was the, the liberal Western culture, other cultures were, for instance, the Islamic cultures um, of the Middle East. And Pim Fortuyn was an editor of the Huntington thesis, um, believed therefore that this clash was inevitable, but also believed that there was a superiority of Western liberal thought over that of um, Muslim Islamic thought. And he believed that Islamic thought was not something you could join in with liberal thought, that, that Islam would oppose Western liberalism. Uh, so that was one of his founding ideas, and that's why he believed that Islam was a danger. Um, what you see here, and I think it's very important to note, is that there's a shift here from very much in the late 20th century, where there was a fear of migration in general, and those were for cultural reasons, but they were definitely also for economic reasons, the idea of job displacement, the idea of uh, uh, feeling unsafe because people couldn't, for instance, treat themselves in, in a house well, but now we move towards an ideological representation. There's an idea that these migrants, that they form an ideology that stands against our culture. And the thesis of populists is that open migration was allowed by the elite, often the left-wing elite, and that therefore the elite has sold itself out for the, to the people for these migrants. That's the one of the foundational excesses of populist belief. That then I think is very important to recognize because it also understand, makes it un understandable why many current elite parties have a lack of standing. In the case of Pim Fortuyn, to move back to our history lesson, this, this standing was uh, exacerbated, the second standing was exacerbated due to the murder of Pim Fortuyn uh, on the 6th of May 2001, uh, sorry, 2002. He was murdered by an animal rights activist called Volkert van der Gee. Um, and in the, in the days and weeks leading up to Pim Fortuyn, the Dutch elite system tried to use the same tactic they had used on Jan Maat before. In other words, the cordon sanitaire tactic. We're going to demonize you. We're going to call you an evil man. We're going to say that we don't want to govern with you. We, we think we're going to say that we're despising you. And he himself had said beforehand, um, I feel threatened. And if there's going to be an attack on my life, I know where this would come from. And I, I would not be surprised if such an attack would actually occur on my life. So when he was shot, um, one of his uh, deputies in, in his party uh, said that the, the bullet came from the left, uh, and this led therefore to the uh, selling out of the left-wing elite in the Netherlands as being responsible for the murder of someone who finally spoke the truth about problems with regards to migration and problems with regards to Islam. This idea then became 
challenged further by what eventually would be some the, the person who, who took over the throne of Pim Fortuyn. This is a man called Geert Wilders, who separated in 2004 from his uh, party, the VVD, to try and build his own movement, um, the PVV, the Party for Freedom. This takes place in the backdrop of a of what I think is the first prominent European post 9-11 uh, act of Islamic extremism, namely the murder of the Dutch provocateur theater maker um, Vincent, sorry, Theo van Gogh, a, a, a relative, dis, distant relative of Vincent van Gogh, uh, the du famous Dutch painter, um, who had worked together with the uh, Somali born VVD parliamentarian Ayan Hisha Ali, who now is known as a, a conservative pundit in the United States, where she now lives. And she and they had, for instance, talked about the fact that she, they believed Islam to be incomprehensible uh, and, and sorry, incommensurate with the with women's rights. Um, he was shot by a man called Mohammed Bey, a member of the Hofstad Group, which is an extremist Islamic organization which operated from The Hague. Mohammed Bey now uh, languishes in prison indefinitely for life. Um, and his court case, if, if you are so inclined to read Dutch, is, is, is highly interesting to look at because it's one of the first attempts of justice of judges to understand Islamic extremism, their motiv motivation, and why that therefore that motivation leads, for instance, to a crime with intent in the first place. And, and the definition of that, I think, is highly fascinating, um, well worth to read. Uh, of course, if you want to read about it in English, which I, I appreciate you, you should read Ayan Burma's uh, book about it. Um, which I currently am forgetting the title, so I'm trying to look it up so we could see it at the end of this workshop, maybe. Uh, but Arjen Burma wrote a book about the killing of Theo van Gogh and the consequences it had on Dutch society, which I think is deeply fascinating and very much worth a look. And I think it is, its lessons are applicable across the Netherlands to the, to very much other countries as well. Geert Wildersen, like I said, in 2004 took over and he slowly radicalized his viewpoint. So he started out with saying we want a, a stop on the building of mosques. Now he wants to demolish all mosques. He has proposed a ban on the Quran, a ban on headscarves, a ban on the burqa, which in limited fashion has uh, translated into legislation in the past our parliament. This man is a firebrand and he currently uh, consistently polls at roughly 15 to 20 percent of the poll of the of uh, the polls uh, and takes as many seats in our parliament and has done so uh, for more than a decade. That's where we currently are. The response of Cordon Sanitaire, of course, was no longer possible. Although uh, in, in our last election, in, uh, which took place March this year, every party, like almost every party said they would not form a government co governing coalition with Keert Wilders as PVV, uh, which is one of the reasons why currently our parliament is deadlocked to try to form a new government because there are just simply very few mathematical possibilities uh, possible right now. Um, and Keert Wilders has in the past supported, however, a supply uh, confident, a confidence uh, and supply chain uh, coalition with the two center-right parties of the VVD and the CDA, which have roughly the Christian and the secular conservative parties in the Netherlands, uh, although that one only lasted for a year and a half after uh, he didn't want to enter into negotiations needed, we needed to have uh, to, to deal with the Euro crisis of 2012. So like I said, we didn't have the possibility to approach the court on sanitaire, so there's been two approaches that have been taking place. The first one is, is direct opposition, which has predominantly been done by the left and the progressive parties. Uh, so the the, 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 the Liberal Democrat Tish party for us called the D66 uh, gained a large amount of popularity with the leader Alexander Pechtold trying to take Wilders' hat on, calling him a racist, explaining why he thinks he's a racist. Uh, and that's the first element of critique that we've tried. The other one is an appeasement critique, believing that there is a legitimate value that the voters for Geert Wilders hold and therefore wanted to come to a sort of negotiation where we try to moderate their stance. This is, this is what many center-right parties have done. Uh, for instance, they've, ta they've taken their stances with regards to, to integration. They've made integration far more mandatory. They've more professed the idea that people need to adopt cultural integration, that people need to learn the language, and that they can be fined if they don't learn that. Similarly, uh, that we should restrict the amount of migration, we should restrict the amount of refugees that we enter into our countries, um, as well as believing that there is a problem with the integration, that there is a problem of uh, uh, 
So, for instance, the problems that they, f that they believe are we have a large amount of, of crime uh, relative to the proportion of the population taking place by Moroccan uh, and Antillian youth. Although most criminologists cite the statistics that if you look at the income disparity uh, within these groups compared to the general population, income disparity can be one of the leading expl explainers for why there's more crime within these groups. Um, their cultural explanations have been a predominantly popular thing to discuss in the Netherlands, uh, and they therefore believe that there's a lack of um, well of race of well parenting. There's a lack of uh, discipline uh, within these communities, uh, lack of calling these kids out, and, and irresponsibility, uh, and, a, and a feeling of like princeling culture that these certainly the boys can do whatever they want uh, as part of the traditional culture, and that is the um, predominant idea uh, within a large part of the population as to why the crime rights are so high, and this is also something therefore that the centre right governing coalitions have, have, have tried to see, sought to address in those terms. So they appease to the uh, ability of gate builders uh, to rob the people by moving closer to what the people want and trying to help them in that regard. Given this, given this history, given where we are right now, and given the polarizing debates that we took, that we talked about, so we talked about the, the debate about criminality, the debate about the ideology of Islam, and for instance, it's anti, it's, it's the anti-gay tendencies of some members of Islamic communities, um, or even the anti-Semitic tendencies that some of them tend to, slide, as well as generally uh, their, their lack of economic integration. And then finally, the uh, fact that many migrants argue that they oppose nativist cultural traditions, like black like peeps, um, or for instance, in France are against secularism, because uh, they believe secularism to be an uh, oppressive construct, an anti-Islam construct. Um, there are three things I think that many populist voters believe in. So the first thing I think many of them believe in is the idea that migration is economically negative. So they believe in a zero sum game of limited amount of jobs and that migrant people take over jobs that could have gone to nativist Dutch people. And that premises itself in the idea that the nativist Dutch people are the ones that the government should predominantly care itself about because they are the people that elites need to take care of themselves. The second idea is the idea of cultural superiority and the belief that the other culture is not just not just inferior to us for instance that they believe that this culture could be inferior towards women could be inferior towards uh, other liberal values um but specifically this culture is out there with an agenda to try and take over and Therefore, they believe, for instance, that Islamification could exist, uh, that, that, that there's, a, there's an agenda of Islamification across many Western European states that would want to take over and have their value system and Sharia law enshrined within this uh, and an end to the liberal values that they themselves support. The third thing, and we haven't talked about this a lot, the third idea is with regards to um, a, a, a belief that the European project is a key contributing factor to these elements and therefore this one is dangerous as well uh, and here's where they sometimes meet left-wing populists as well although their rationale behind disliking europe is different so left-wing populists dislike europe because they believe it is a symbol of neoliberalism that is to say that they believe that the european union tries to push forward free market thinking even if that is dangerous for instance to local industries or infant industries uh, of, of underdeveloped nations even if even if it uh, enshrines the power of corporate elites who can now make more money um through uh, regulations and more confounding things, and there's a genuine democratic deficit in Europe. So that, that's the idea of the center left. The center right believes that the free market and certainly the freedom of movement is exacerbating the problems of, mar of migrants trying to move into other countries where they uh, economically and culturally are distorting this country. So we're still here, for instance, also about the influx of Eastern European migrants after 10 Eastern European countries joined the EU in 2005, I think. Uh, could be 2004, I'm not entirely certain anymore. And uh, therefore, that's something that uh, the populace have, those populists have riled against as well. This, is, of course, has gone on longer in the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom has had a far more ambivalent relationship with the EU since its joining in the first place, uh, but has become a popular rallying point amongst populists uh, in the early part of the 20th century, certainly after the extension of 10 for, uh, uh, more countries to the European Union. So that's what they believe in that regard. So I'm going to take a sip of water.
if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now because I'm I've moved a little bit far away from the history part and talking to the ideology part, and this means that we're now going to talk a little bit more about features and how to use them in debating. If you have any questions about this part or its applicability, for instance, in other countries, feel free to ask a question. So I'm looking at the group chat currently. Uh, there's a group chat option, and I am uh, not seeing any chats here. So I'm uh, going to assume this means that there are no questions currently outstanding, and I'm just going to move on uh, to the next. So features of populist thought. Just to um, very briefly. Iterate for people who have, have moved in. Uh, they believe that there's an elite and a people, and that the elite um, and the people are juxtaposed to each other. In other words, that the current elite is opposing towards the people. There are various strategies, therefore, that you can entertain and try to use to combat populism. The first one is try to ignore them, to use what we call the cordon sanitaire or close rank strategy, and try to ignore them in that regard. The second thing is try to appease them. Um, by which we mean we try to take over some of their viewpoints, believing that there is a, a reasonable rationale behind some of the things they say, that there is a common ground behind some of the things we say and try to move them and, and, and persuade the people that because we have now taken a more moderate stance, um, it is now okay and a populist threat is over. The third strategy is direct support, which is that we try to work together with the populist party. However, that often has been proven difficult. So we've had supply and confidence governments in the Netherlands, but also in Denmark, in Sweden, in Finland, uh, and in Scandinavian countries, they sometimes even form part of coalition governments. Um, the difficulty for these populist movements is very often they're relatively unstable. They often are built on the backbone of one or uh, a small group of leaders. Uh, notice, for instance, the Alternative for Deutschland, uh, which hasn't managed to rally itself amongst a single leader in a very large part because the AFD has had difficulties finding out what branch of populism they support most. Are they, as they used to be founded, a predominantly anti-EU? idea who thinks that the eu is getting is creating a bad deal for germany are they anti-migration are they even specifically anti-islam um elements of that exist in the entire party but what should take the dominant course and if some of these things should take the course is heavily up for debate and that's why it led to a large amount of infighting amongst the alternative for deutschland uh, because they have tried to set themselves up democratically uh, and which is why for instance they also did the post of their leader um, earlier this year uh, and which is why it's unlikely that they will be holding an incredibly large amount of voting share um, in the upcoming elections, although it is projected that they at least will get some seats in the Bundestag. The fourth option is to directly try and refute them. And I think the interesting and compelling idea about refutation and why it works and doesn't work is the exact idea of the elites have sold the people out, which is why I think very many traditional center-left movements have been highly ineffective because they have by the people are seen as a quite large amount of the problem. So if we look at the voting profile, for instance, of the PVV in the Netherlands, but also of other parties, many of these people either didn't vote at all uh, and belonged to uh, what you could describe to be broadly construed as the labor class, or used to vote for center-left parties. And they feel now betrayed by the center-left parties because they feel that migration has been a root cause for um, for their for their for their for their uh, negative life situations. Um, which is why I think Emmanuel Macron is a fascinating example, because I think what Emmanuel Macron is, uh, is someone who manages to effectively communicate that he isn't part of the elite. So he can use the similar ideas that the centre-left, certainly the centre-centre-left has had um, over the past 10, 15 years after the fall of the Soviet Union and the embracement of like capitalism amongst the left in Europe. But without the idea of being part of the elite that sold them out in the first place, being a fresh young face and therefore offering new solutions and therefore also being able to say, um, I can offer you solutions for your plight because I do think that the elite has failed you in that regard. Which is why I think that an interesting idea is that, a, that the best antidote to right wing populism might in some cases be left wing populism. But that it very much must not come from the elite in that regard. The difficulty, of course, there is also that. Uh, nowadays, the way in which many people perceive this news is through uh, news media as well. So if you look, for instance, at the 
uh, Daily Mail in the United Kingdom, um, or if you look at the Netherlands, if you look at the Telegraaf, or online webloads like Yalta.nl, or um, the Dark Lexus Standard, the Daily Standard Bearer, um, those are a, a, a group of people who predominantly class as old rights, which means that they, which means that a they take into account uh, European right wing extremist views. On the other hand, they take into account classic small state views, classic conservative views. There's an overlap where the conservative new movement is growing closer together in the, in the media outlets and the outlets that they use um, with the populist right. Uh, and as a consequence, it therefore becomes harder for left for left wing movements and ideas to to tackle uh, uh, the populist movements uh, because they are now also attacked on their economic policies and their uh, moral policies of redistribution versus the ability to to you gain your own wealth in that regard. So I think that is one of the challenges in order for those direct contributions that progressive movements are having difficulties with in uh, our societies. So a couple of Outstanding issues, therefore. I think the first outstanding issue is regards to their voter base, who votes for these uh, parties. Because um, I think the predominantly large voter base that we often talk about is the working class whites. Um, and the idea behind them is that they vote, for instance, because A, they believe they're economically disenfranchised, uh, they have a lack of jobs in that regard, and they believe that those jobs have been taken over by migration waves. Um, there's Little economic evidence to suggest that this is the case, but that's a firmly held belief. And I think this is also a failure of explaining exactly what the contributory causes have been for these economic uh, downturns. Because I think equally we could talk about uh, uh, automatization, we could talk about globalization as being predominant narratives and suggestions as to why uh, job growth and wage growth has stagnated over the past 10, 15 years. For a for a group within society, um, but that those narratives haven't been made very successfully uh, because most of the parties have, in mainstream parties for the past 15, 20 years, have started defending the status quo politically speaking, and as a consequence, the populist idea has been seen as the only alternative. Um, and I think the same goes for the European Union. More more federalism was seen as the only option, uh, and populists have been the only ones who offered a genuine alternative to a more federalized European Union. That's something that therefore people who were just satisfied with the option of the status quo flocked towards the populist right um, as their precursor in that regard. So they are the biggest group, but there are other groups as well. Um, so interesting to note is that very many Hindus in the Netherlands, but also Indian uh, English people uh, vote for UKIP in the United Kingdom. Um, and that's in part because the Islam critique uh, is something that is popular amongst Hindus, certainly those of Indian descent um, as well. Um, because there's a large amount of like hostility within that region between Muslims and Hindus, um, which is something that can be preyed upon. So there are other minority groups who feel, for instance, there's also the bad name being uh, given to them by certain groups, and they believe there's a harsher treatment necessary from these groups themselves. Secondly, um, there are, like I said, uh, some some highly educated conservative right wing people, and a interesting group is there's quite a large amount of white LGBT people who vote for these parties, uh, again, because of the angle of believing that their hard-won freedoms could be taken in by migrants. And whilst there are figures that suggest that there are more people, for instance, from Muslim descent in the Netherlands who are negative towards gay rights, a uh, majority of them are positive about the gay rights. So this isn't this, this doesn't seem to, to hold with the critique or idea that this is an ideology in that regard. So I think that's an important frame in order to take into account. The second thing we took can talk about is leadership structures. As I said, uh, these are often quite elitist uh, uh, people who take into power. And that, that, that's, I think, necessary because you need to have know-how, resources, uh, and to be in the circle in order to, to build a political campaign machine. Uh, so that's why it's, it's quite likely these people become elitists. Uh, they also tend to be largely focused around individuals. It turns out to be incredibly difficult to find good people to, to uh, support you. Notice a, a large amount of scandals that have always erupted amongst uh, backbenchers of populist parties. In the Netherlands, we've had a man who, uh, after a fight with his neighbor, pissed in the letterbox of uh, their neighbors. We've had a uh, spokesperson for the PVV who stole a large amount of money uh, in order to uh, fund his coke and gambling addiction. Uh, we've had people who've lied about their CVs. Uh, the LPF had a 
woman who suggested that she had never met the dictator Daisy Bautersen, only for eight hours later, a photograph to appear uh, showing her side by side with Daisy Bautersen. So there's always a cast of clowns that's available uh, and it's very hard for them to find talented candidates, which is why they let it to be individualist organizations in that regard. Uh, the Netherlands now is an interesting experiment where a new populist party uh, from the old right uh, uh, intellectual elite is trying to form called the Forum for Democracy, spearheaded by a former Leiden University alum called Thierry Baudet. Um, who tries to try and or orchestrate a more broad popular movement uh, amongst the elite as well. And it, 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 it's, it's, I think, generally concerning, but also fascinating from an intellectual perspective to see where they will develop themselves um, in that regard. The third thing, uh, and, and now we're moving slightly more toward debating, debating things, is um, that what I think we need to understand is the strength of their appeal given all that we talked about so what we see is firstly that they hold limited power currently within our political systems their electoral power seems to be relatively capped to 20 25 percent of the votes in most countries of course depending on your electoral system that might mean that they stand a chance of winning a majority if their electorate would, would have been spread out, spread out relatively well or do they stand a chance to be a a, a seat holder in Parliament, which takes place in the Netherlands, which has a very proportional system, um, which almost equates to like one vote, one seat kind of principle in that regard. Uh, and they hold similar powers across that. But they therefore have a agenda setting power. They can use social media, they can use the, the media discussion, they can use the provocativeness in order to set the agenda and, and discuss very much on what believe in migrants. And, and genuinely, the needle has moved. Um, our countries are far more critical of migrants than they've ever been in the past um if you look for instance at the 2005 election pamphlet of get Wilders, he has 15 points on uh curbing migration and curbing islam islamization of those 15 10 are currently professed by the vvd and cda and uh, they're currently forming a government or trying to form a government that would include for instance the progressive of the 66 um, and it's likely some of these policies will get passed so we definitely see a window movement and they've had, had a genocidal power in the past actual governing power has proved to be difficult for them for instance because they lack the talent pool uh, to effectively move in that regard uh, but also because um, their element of speak for the people and speak without platitudes and without nuance means that when they have to or go into the hard battle of governing and therefore sometimes making compromises, they tend to fail. So that's why, for instance, Get Builders blew up a government after a year and a half because he didn't want to raise the pension age. He uh, didn't want to say that he was okay with uh, reforms needed after the euro crisis. So that's the extent to the power that they have but they also have power very much in the minds of people so it isn't just about politics it's also about like and policy it's also about how do people perceive themselves on the ground and we have seen for instance after every terrorist attack in france in the uk in the netherlands we've seen a rise of anti-muslim incidents as well we have in the netherlands had a monitor cocktail thrown at a mosque we've had a mosque that was being built in leiden that was uh, uh where construction was halted for a couple of days because people tried to take over uh, the terrain of that mosque. Um, we've had asylum seeker centers which have been uh, heavily opposed, uh, where riots taking place in the city of Tiel, with a severed pig's head being uh, arisen outside of the Brabant town of Hayes. Um, and I think that's the dangerous element there. Similarly, they are motivated themselves, they have their own media channels, they have their own Facebook pages. Um, some of the, sometimes they, they manage to have stories that are factual and they, they become leading causes. So there have been incidents of sexual assault, for instance, taking place for migrants and refugees, uh, former refugees. Um, and those have been leading precursors to suggest that all they're saying about these refugees is correct and right. Um, even though I think the proper analytical lens for that is that this is a man problem because sexual assault, sadly, is incredibly prevalent amongst in, in Europe. Uh, headline figures from a European program suggest that one in three women who, who for instance, get abused uh, sexually within her lifetime. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's, if you have tens of thousands of people coming in, the chances some of them would therefore commit sexual assault due to their masculinity rather than due to their Islamic background seems to me to be a compelling 
explanation for that, but those have been leading causes that were for a large amount of resistance within the regard. We have seen popular movements spread up. Uh, the Pegida movement uh, is protesting amongst Germany and has had shootoffs uh, uh, in other countries as well. So we do see there's elements of rise over there. Successful combatments of populist movements have been uh, both uh, giving them what they want to some extent, because uh, UKIP has collapsed after Brexit. Uh, Gerrida seems to have stalled in the polls with some of the votes being gained towards the VVD right now. Um, I, or directly counteracting their belief system uh, by offering alternative explanations to the plights of people. And importantly, this, this can often be better, better done by outsiders. But all in all, we don't have a convincing answer towards populists. It, it seems that just calling them racist a large amount of times isn't enough. Uh, because the problem is, is that they, whilst they, they, they hold clearly racist views, it is too simple to say that they are racists. They look at certain genuinely existing problems in society, look at them through a racist lens or through an anti-Islamic lens or through an anti-migration lens, and therefore profess policy solutions based on those ideas. And therefore, what you need to have to counteract populist movements is generally a counter narrative of what the exact problems are. I think that's the key takeaway I'd want you to have within this discussion. Similarly, the backlash can be real, but it's often limited. So when people talk about afraid of conservative backlash, when they say you don't want to have a certain policy being entered into a debate because you're afraid of the type of backlash that this would cause, Notice this backlash exists, but it's quite limited. Uh, electoral power is limited, protests are limited, and, and, and counter protests do exist and relatively generally occur against movements. Begida has always had a counter protest in the Netherlands whenever it rose up, which had roughly equal amount of people who came to that protest as well. We've had marches in favor of migrants. Uh, mar we've, we've had a walk uh, in favor of refugees trying to collect money. Um, generally, there is a civil society that takes a anti-populist stance uh, and I think they have a similar pool in that regard so it is a battle of ideologies and the idea that populists are now taking over Europe which you could get maybe if you'd read some media nowadays I think is exaggerated to that extent what is worrying I think is the European level because we haven't managed to create a counter narrative to the European level I think that's by and large because I think populists have been most reasonable on the European level. I think that the, the critique on Europe has been most reasonable in that regard because Europe genuinely has had issues with explaining where they come from. They've genuinely had issues with explaining where the economic policy program would work in that regard um, and generally it's a difficulty try, trying to get her with this value system. Europe is now currently undergoing a fascinating move where the EU in Brussels is trying to be more and more critical of countries that are becoming anti-democratic. It has taken away a large amount of structure funds for Hungary in response to Hungary becoming more and more belligerent against liberal NGOs uh, and I am imagining Poland might be next on that list um, if they solve up the courage to take up on one of the largest country in the EU in that regard um, but all in all populists have had reasonable critiques of the EU uh, underlying of course some basis assumptions underlying very much uh, I think the wrong policy prescription for how to deal with the problems of the EU. Um, but there it's very, been very hard to build a kind of narrative in that regard. It seems the election of Donald Trump uh, and the wake up uh, that that has caused for the um, moderates in Europe has managed that that critique has stalled and that there's a belief that cooperation is necessary now that our big military ally across the transatlantic at least seems to be less likely to hold our head in favor. Um, but that's, I think, also an issue that is currently unsolved. This is all I have to say. Um, I haven't, I said I haven't seen any questions pop up, uh, but if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them either underneath the YouTube feed or underneath the Facebook post that has been set up by Olivia. Uh, I think in the Communist Case Call group or the Scottish EUDC group. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. I uh, hope you enjoyed listening to this as well. Um, as said, uh, there are some literature views you can have. So I, what I suggest is you'd, you'd, uh, you read the Iron Bureau book, which I'm going to Google very quickly to find out what is. I think it's called A Murder in Amsterdam. I'm not entirely certain. I think it is a fascinating idea. Um, I think it's a funny book in that regard. Yeah, it's called Murder in Amsterdam. I think that is a very good book to understand the uh, way in which the society reacted to that uh, terrorist killing. And I think that's important to um, read. And I think it's still relevant even um, 10 years after it has been written. Um, I would also suggest that you'd 
generally just try and keep following the news uh, and look at the back archives of The Economist. Um, the Foreign Affairs had a very interesting issue about Trump, populism uh, and Trump afterwards, which might, which was relatively okay, um, relatively applicable towards Europe, although I think there are clear differences between Trump and the other issues. For one, because Trump operates within a very different political context because he operates within the, within the conservative right party rather than providing an alternative to the conservative right party in that regard. Um, and what I also suggest you do if you live in a country where populists exist, I suggest you, do, you walk on the street and start a judgment-free conversation with populists. Because one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had with a PVV voter has left me sometimes looking for answers in how to combat the populism, which I personally think is a wrong ideology, is a conversation of a woman who lived, who was in her 50s, uh, and she had to take care of her uh, elderly and very ill grandmother, sorry, mother, and um, she was very able to, unable to, to afford the wages. Her husband had been laid off, and in her street, a refugee family had started living in, and they moved in new furniture, and this furniture was given as grants by uh, well-meaning volunteers. And her question was, how can they get so much? Whilst I don't get anything, I don't have enough money to take care of my elderly and ill mother who is currently being laying unwashed in elderly pension care, which is understaffed and underfunded. Uh, our welfare payments are slashed. How do I get less whilst they get everything? And to be honest, I think it is incredibly hard to formulate an answer to her that is fair and that makes it understandable. And that makes it understandable why she wouldn't vote for the populist. Um, you could argue, of course, in the abstract, that these refugees aren't to blame for her, that it is definitely the government who needs to set funding priorities differently, uh, and that they can both provide for refugees as well as provide for better health care and social welfare system. And there are options to do that. Uh, you'd, you'd have to increase the taxation or have other policy uh, priorities. But I think it is a incredibly difficult conversation to have. So if you'd want to know more about populism, I, I, I suggest everyone that if you genuinely are concerned and want to learn more about populism, talk with people who vote for these parties. Not with prejudgment, not trying to convince them, but talk what moves them. I think that's an incredibly important viewpoint to add to your discussion. And then read the liberal media you might read and read why. All the problem analysis that these people have is, is, is wrong but understandably wrong. Thank you very much. And I hope you can have a very pleasant evening. Goodbye.